the Joe Rogan experience. So what is the corporation about? The corporation is the story of a Cuban-American organized crime organization that began in the mid-1960s and existed all the way to the end of the century. And it was led by this mobster named Jose Miguel Battle, who was kind of a legendary figure in Cuban-American circles because he was a hero from the Bay of Pigs invasion, the, uh, the attempt to, to reclaim Cuba, take back Cuba, the inv invasion, 1961, which was a disaster for everyone involved. Battle wound up in prison along with the rest of the brigade. And when he got out and came back to the U.S., he was determined to get Castro uh, and take back Cuba. So he set up this criminal thing, and it was based on uh, one racket primarily, Bolita, the number, the lottery, the illegal lottery. Before the lottery was legal, it was illegal, and it was controlled by organized crime, and it was a huge moneymaker, big moneymaker for the mob going back to the 1920s. Everyone bets the number. Little old ladies bet the number, priests, cops. You know, you can bet a nickel, you can bet a dime, you can bet $10,000 hugely profitable for whoever controls and organizes it. Well, the Cubans controlled and organized it on the eastern coast of the United States, from New Jersey and New York all the way down to Miami. And the guy who controlled it was Battle. And he became legendary based on that. They controlled the, the whole number system? Because I know there's a lot of Italians that were involved well, in that they as went, well, right? they went to the mafia. Uh, one of the first things Battle did, Battle had been a cop, a vice cop in Havana in the 1950s. During uh, the Before era, the turnover. Yeah, during the era when the mob, Joey was talking about Havana Nocturne. That's what that book was about, the era of the mob in Havana in the 50s, Meyer Lansky, Santo Traficante, and how they controlled that until Castro came along and spoiled the party. And the revolution happened, and they got chased out of there. Battle had been a vice cop in Havana during those years, and he knew all those uh, high-ranking mobsters. And, in fact, he was a bag man who delivered money— from the skim at the casinos in Havana to the presidential palace. So Battle knew how the world went round, and he made those connections, and when he finally gets to the U.S. and wants to start his own thing, first thing he does is go to Santo Traficante and says, can you make the proper introductions for me? Traficante introduces him to Fat Tony Salerno in New York City, who controls the numbers racket for all five families, and Battle says, look, Things are changing in Cuba. Over the next couple of decades, you're going to have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Cubans coming to live in the United States. They all bet the number. That's a huge market. If you let me take over this thing and organize it, you will get a piece of, you will get your piece of everything. And the mafia said yes. And so the Cubans took over. And they controlled everything. I mean, in New York City in the 70s and 80s, there were probably 200 to 300 bolita spots where you could go bet the number. That's what the Cubans call it, bolita, little ball. And uh, so they controlled it, and they took care of the, the mafia, and everybody was got fat and happy uh, for a while until it turned bad and they started killing each other. Now, when Joey, when you heard about this book, this is something that you were very intimately involved in when you were a kid. Very. You know, I come on your show and I tell you, there's a hundred stories I could tell you, and there's a thousand I can't. And when he told, when I read the thesis for this book, I just knew. I just fucking knew. You know, I grew up in numbers. When I went to Catholic school on Saturdays, when I came home on Fridays, on Saturdays at the age of eight, I was sent to different locations in the city, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and I would make $50 going to run errands, running numbers, go tell this guy the first number of the day is two. You know, so I grew up in it. I grew up in a house where the bookie would call my mother by 3 o'clock and go, what's the numbers for the day? And my mother would give him a fucking laundry list, you know. And uh, it's very interesting. In this book, he also covers the mysticism of the number. So if I'm at your house and your daughter walks in with a hockey shirt and her number's 13, I'll look at you and go, Joe, give me a number from 0 to 9. 5. And I pick up the phone and I bet 513. If I look out my window and the cop car is 506, I put $5 on 506. If I have a dream about an eagle, when I go down to the Bolita spot, there's books that they sell, books of dreams. 
and I take that book and I look up Eagle, and if Eagle's number eight, <laughs> I pay eight thirteen. It's you know you you were mentioning and a couple months ago that your grandmother took numbers. Yeah, grandmother was Sicilian. Sicilian people have the same uh, every day they live. Today's the day. Yep. Today's the day, Joe Rogan. Yep. Today's the day I'm hitting the number. Yep. I'm not getting. You know, That's all that, she talked about. That dream. <laughs> that dream. Of, yeah. Again, we're going back yeah. to an immigrant mentality. Yeah. That those three numbers today, if God wants, if God is real, what He says is true. My number's gonna come out today. Yeah. When is my ship gonna come in? That. Right. That's right, it. Right. You know, that you hope. work a you work a plain Jane dream. You're a, you're a blue collar person, and on the way home every day by three thirty, you put the number in. That's it. That's what yeah. you do. Something that's, to believe in. It's that's like, something it's like to a religion. believe in. Yeah. yeah. Numerology. And with Cubans, uh, it was very mystical. It was tied into uh, dreams and belief. The idea was you bet the number and you try to make your dreams come true. That's literally what you're doing. You're trying to make your dreams come true. And the bolita guys, the boliteros, the ones who control it, they're the dream makers. They're the guys who are making it possible for your dreams to come true. So they had tremendous stature in the community. In the community. They were yeah. dream solvers. So you work D TJ's Jose Battle, and you're an independent bookie. Your job is to sit at a Brindy Lounge in West New York from not, 10 to 3, drinking, and all day long people come in and go, Joe, give me five seventeen, three dollars $3. Give me three oh three one dollar At 3 o'clock, 3.30, a number comes out. If that number wins, if I give you 500, you get 3,000 from battle. You give me 2,500. So you make 500 off the top and then I tip you. The thing that battle did was he didn't take 10 points. He let you run your independent action unless you called it into him. You know, it's very, you ever watch the movie, uh, uh, what's the movie with Mickey Rourke and the Chinese people? Year of the Dragon. Yeah, yeah. great Remember? fucking movie. Great movie when he says, you know, for years the Chinese were bringing in the heroin and they were selling it to the Italians. You know, a $50,000 investment could make you $500,000. Chinese weren't seeing that. Like, they weren't seeing that. Why? Because they, didn't have, they couldn't bring it out. They couldn't sell it. Black people and Spanish people would bitch slap them to death. So the same thing happened with Bolita. Fat Tony Salerno knew that he had a big thing coming with the Cubans, but Cubans want to put a bet in with Cubans. Mm. Yeah. Do you understand yeah. me? Yeah. Italians, they want to put a bet in with Italians. Right. Puerto Ricans, they want to put a bet in with a Puerto Rican. Isn't that a big thing that was with the numbers? It was that it was a community thing. It's a well, community thing. Because everybody so. would talk about the numbers. Yeah. It wouldn't yeah. be like the lottery is some sort of a government-funded yeah. thing, and it seems like it's got a lot of red tape and official, and there's no wiggle room. The, the, the numbers seem to be closer well, to, like, the community. Especially with Latinos. Especially it, with Latinos. Yeah, it, it was, the, in some ways, the core of the community. The number of spots where everybody would hang out. You'd go to here in the neighborhood, La Bole in La Calle. The, the, what is that? The gossip in the streets. You'd go there to hear the neighborhood gossip. Uh, yeah, it was, and, and it was never meant to be violent. Back in Cuba, Bolita was not violent. It was <clears throat> illegal, but it wasn't violent. And, and it turned very violent in, in the United States. The corporation became so profitable. I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars on a monthly basis, billions of dollars over the course of the life of this organization, billions of dollars, more than they could. The hardest thing they had was what to do with the money. I mean, they, they, they would literally strap money to people to, as money couriers to try to get it out of the country to get it into uh, get it into offshore bank accounts wow. and, and launder the money. They had more money than they knew. It, it was a license to print money. It was hugely profitable. That's what made it violent. Then you started having gangsters vying for territory, territorial disputes, greed. Greed took over, and it got very ugly. Now, is this between Cubans? Between Cubans, between the Cubans and the Italians. See, this guy, Battle, was very charismatic leader uh, with some great leadership qualities. He'd been a hero in the Bay of Pigs invasion. He saved some guys' lives. Um, when I first heard that story, I didn't. I said, I got to verify that. Maybe this is just a story a guy told about himself to burnish his legend. So I found... 
the guys that he saved. And I found the guy's two brothers who went with him to save that the guys that he saved. And I went to Cuba, to the Bay of Pigs, to the exact location where he saved these guys to verify this story. And it was absolutely true. He, in a, an act of incredible heroism, he, he saved the life of a number of his platoon members. And so that was his reputation from then on. He was revered in the community. He was a hero. And people defended him. Even even when it it turned ugly and he became a ruthless boss who was killing people left and right, he had his defenders because of his legend as a hero in the community. And so um, the power that he had. But he also had this, uh, <laughs> Joey and I were talking about this, um, Cubans have this, Latinos have this, everybody has it, but Cubans have it, uh, desire for revenge. This guy, you know, the Bay of Pigs invasion was an attempt at revenge, to get revenge against Castro, and they were humiliated by that process. And a lot of the guys from that generation had an unfinished agenda for revenge. So if you wronged this guy battle in any way, he was going to get you even if it took years and years of calculation. I mean, there's stories in the book about this one guy who killed his brother named Palulu. He took, it took nine years and 12 attempts before they finally killed this guy Palulu. They shot him in his hospital. He was in the hospital. They shot him, had an assassin dress up as a male nurse and go into the hospital and shoot him between the eyes because wow. there had been so many failed attempts. They weren't going to fail this time. And that's in battle took 12 years. I mean, took nine years. Did they years. catch the assassin? No, never caught him. Really? No, no Just way. Bang, disappeared and in out the out I believe the assassin got killed later because he was talking about it, having done it, and so battle had him killed. Wow. Yeah. So the, the revenge uh, motive, the revenge motive um, kind of drove battle off the deep end. And uh, Somewhere along the line, he broke bad, so to speak. I mean, I don't know if he was ever good and had to break bad. But he started doing internal killings that really had nothing to do about business. They were all about revenge. Well, th this is a, a theme that happens a lot with organized crime people, right? It's like they just get a taste of killing people, and it becomes easier and easier. And then they, like, that was the thing about Murder Machine, right? About Roy DeMeo? Right. Yeah. Just, you just can't. You just was killing people just over anything to it. after yeah. a while. That's another book you gave me. Yeah, Murder Machine. <laughs> I was reading all those books on the road. <laughs>